Hi, everyone. Welcome to our eighth week of the semester. Uh, <clears throat> last time we talked about how to find local extrema and inflection points and that sort of thing for one function at a time. And that was great, and that was good practice for what we're going to do today, where instead of analyzing just one function at a time, by putting in a little more effort, we can understand the behavior of a family of infinitely many related curves all in one go. So some families that we already know are things like we know the family of linear functions, mx plus b. And probably as soon as you see one of these mem a member of this family, you know pretty much everything there is to know about it because you understand the whole family. So if you see 7x minus 11, you say, oh, I know that the slope is 7, y-intercept is negative 11. Then if you see negative 3x plus 5, it's not as if it's some completely strange and thing that, you've never under that you don't understand because it's a member of the same family. Similarly here, you probably know, for example, the sine of a tells you if the parabola opens upward or downward. You might know some formula for finding the x-coordinate of the vertex, negative b over 2a. You might even know a way to find the roots of this using the quadratic formula if they exist. And the family a sine of bx plus c is one that we looked at in the second week of the semester. And again, I think we benefited from knowing how a, b, and c affect the shape of the, of the curve. And then, therefore, we know for any value of a, b, and c, we know what the graph is going to look like here. So let's try an uh, example here. We're not going to try, this was linear functions, quadratics. We're not going to do the entire cubic function family all in one go. That's a little, uh, can be a little tedious, and there are some uh, annoying little things that you have to deal with there. So let's just look at the members that take the form ax cubed minus bx squared where a and b are positive constants. And we want to figure out everything we can about this family of curves. So we're going to start with just finding the roots. So this is not a calculus problem. So this just means setting the equation equal to 0. And as I hope we know by now, it would be very dangerous to divide by x squared here. We would lose one answer. So instead of doing that, we'll just factor out and x squared, and we get ax minus b. So this means either x squared is 0, and if x squared is 0, that means x is 0. Or it means ax minus b is 0, and if we bring the b to the other side and solve for x, we get x equals b over a. So now we know that every member of this family has two roots, one at 0 and one at b over a. Now let's try to do some calculus here. So we want to try to figure out where it's got local extrema. And for that, we need to find what we called the critical points last week and identify them as local maxima, minima, or neither. So remember, a critical point is a candidate. It's where you might have a max or a min. And so that's where the first derivative is either equal to 0 or is undefined. So we've got our function ax cubed minus bx squared. Do we need the product rule for ax cubed? We do not need the product rule because a is a constant, right? So we just use the constant multiple rule. The a stays. The 3 comes down. We get 3ax squared. And then the derivative of bx squared is 2bx. So now we're supposed to ask ourselves, is this ever undefined? And the answer is no, because this is just a quadratic, a parabola. It's never going to be dividing by 0 or anything bad like that. So all we have to do now is set this equal to 0. Again, we want to factor something out on this side. We can factor an x out. And we're left with 3ax minus 2b. <clears throat> so this is a situation we like, where we have a product of real numbers being 0. This means that either x is 0, or if this thing is 0, that means x is 2b over 3a. So now how do we decide if we've got maxima, minima, or neither? The technique that we used last week was to draw a number line. So if I draw my number line, and now we've got to decide whether this number 2b over 3a is on the left or the right of 0. So what do you think? Do we know whether that's on the left or the right of the 0, depending on the sign of b and a? We do, because we were told that both b and a were positive numbers. And therefore, the top of this is positive, the bottom is positive, the whole thing is positive. So we can put our 0 over here and our 2b over 3a over there. And now we want to be plugging in numbers to figure out what the sine of f prime is. So on the left, I can pick in any number that I like, left of 0, so say, let's say negative 1. I want to figure out the sine of f prime 
of negative 1. So I'm going to plug in. So uh, you should ask yourself, is it easier to plug into the factored or the unfactored form? And in these cases, it's always going to be better to plug into the factored form. It's going to be less work because all we care about is the sign, not the actual value. So if I plug a negative 1 in for x, I'm going to get a negative. And when I plug a negative 1 in here, I'm going to get negative 3a minus 2b. Now what do we know about that? We know a is positive, so negative 3a is negative. And then we're subtracting a positive, which makes this whole thing even more negative. So this is negative times negative. And if we get a negative times a negative, that's a positive. So what does that tell us about f prime out there? Or what does it tell us about f? If f prime is positive, that means the slope of f is positive. It means f is going up, so f is increasing. So we know that 0 cannot be a local min, but it might be a local max. We've got to pick a number in here. What number can we pick in there? Could I pick 1? Could I pick 1 half? Could I pick 1 1 millionth? We can't pick any of those because we do not know what this is. All, this, all that we know is that this number is positive. If b were some small positive and a were some huge, huge positive, this number might be very, 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 very close to 0. So there isn't any specific actual number that we know in here. So this is where we're going to have to do a little bit more work, but there's a lot more reward because we're, an we're analyzing the entire family all in one go. So I want to pick a number that is between here and here. And one way to move a number closer to 0 is to cut it in half. So if I divide this number by 2, it's, already, it's positive. It will become less positive. It will put me right there in the middle. So a number that I could pick in between there, if I cut this number in half, I get b over 3a. And there's many different choices you could have chosen. You could choose b over 4a, b over 5a, b over 29a, as long as it's something that you're sure is between here and here. So now I'm going to plug this b over 3a into my derivative. I'm plugging a positive number for x, so that's going to be a positive. And now let's see what we happens when we plug b over 3a in for this x. We're going to get 3a times b over 3a minus 2b. So the 3 a's cancel, and we get b minus 2b. So b minus 2b is negative b. b itself was positive, so negative b is negative. So we get a positive times a negative, which is a negative, meaning that 0 did work out to be a local maximum. Let me ask you one more thing. Could I have taken, instead of b over 3a, instead of cutting the number in half, if I had taken, subtracted 1 from this number and done 2b over 3a minus 1, that will definitely move the number to the left. But is that going to be an OK value to choose for this interval? What do you think? 2b over 3a, that whole thing minus 1. And the answer is no. We can't choose that because if this number were already less than 1, say this number were 6 tenths, when I subtract 1 from it, I get negative 4 tenths, meaning I've moved all the way back over into this part of the number line, which I don't want to do. So there's nothing we can subtract from this to put it in here. Cutting it in half is safe. Now we want to pick something out here. Here we actually could add 1. Usually adding 1 or subtracting 1 doesn't make the algebra work out as nicely. So if cutting a number in half moved it to the left, closer to 0, doubling a number should move it to the right, doubling a positive number. So if I double this number, I'm going to get 4b over 3a. And again, you could choose a variety of things. You could choose 3b over 3a, which would just be b over a, or 7b over 3a, whatever you like. It's just got to be something bigger than this. We're going to plug this in. I'm plugging a positive in for x, so that's going to be positive. And now I'm going to get 3a. For x, I'm going to put in 4b over 3a minus 2b. The 3a's cancel, just like they did there. But now I've got 4b minus 2b. And 4b minus 2b is 2b. And since b was positive, 2b is positive. So we get a positive positive, which means f prime is positive out there, which means f is increasing out there. So what does that tell us? So f has a local max at x equals 0. And f has a local min at x equals 2b over 3a. 
So now you know that every member of this family always is going to have a local max at 0 and a local min at 2b over 3a. So for example, if you're collecting data from some experiment and you keep asking your computer to fit a, uh, make a best fit curve to that data, and say the, curve, the, the formula kept, the computer kept giving you members of this family, ax cubed minus bx squared, and you got tired of analyzing them one at a time, again and again and again. Instead, you just analyzed the whole family all in one go, and now you know in advance what's going to happen. As soon as you see b and a, you know the value of your local min, and you know you're always going to have a local max at 0. And let's find the x values of the inflection points. That's the next thing to do to see what this graph looks like. So what's an inflection point? Remember, that's where we f changes concavity. So when f goes from concave up to concave down, or the other way around. And the easiest way to look at concavity is to look at the sine of what derivative? If you think back to our useful chart, it's the sine of the second derivative being positive or negative that tells whether f is concave up or concave down. So I'd like to compute f double prime of x. So which one of these would be easier to take the derivative of, the unfactored or the factored form? If you use the factored form, you have to use the product rule. If you use the unfactored form, you won't, so let's use the unfactored form. Derivative of 3ax squared is 6ax. Derivative of 2bx is 2b. We should ask ourselves, can this ever be 0? I mean, sorry, can this ever be undefined? Uh, this can never be undefined. In fact, this is a line. So all we have to do is set this equal to 0. If you want, you could factor something out here, right? You could factor out a 2. And we're just left with 3ax minus b. So now you want to ask yourselves, when does 2 equal 0? And unless you're doing something in modulo 2 arithmetic, uh, 2 will not be equal to 0. So that can't be 0. So this just means that x has to be equal to 3ax minus b has to be 0, meaning x is b over 3a. Are we guaranteed that this is an inflection point? As we saw last week, we have to actually check, do a number line to see whether we do or do not have an inflection point here. So I'm going to put the b over 3a down here. And I want to pick a number on the left and on the right. In one of these cases, we get an easy number to pick because b and a are both, the signs of b and a are both positive. So we know b over 3a is positive. So a number that's over here definitely is 0. So if I take f double prime of 0, we're going to get what? We're going to get 2, which is positive, times negative b, so just negative 2b, which is less than 0. So that means that f double prime is negative out here. What does that tell us about the concavity of f? If f double prime is negative, f is concave down. And now I need to pick a number on the right of b over 3a. As we talked about earlier, if you double a number, you move it farther from 0. So if I double this number, it moves even more positive. So let's take f double prime of 2b over 3a. So when I plug in there, I get 2, 3a for x. I'm doing 2b over 3a minus b. The 3a's cancel. We just get 2b minus b, which is positive, multiplied by 2. That's greater than 0. So f double prime is positive out there, meaning f is concave up. So we did find that this candidate for being an inflection point is an inflection point. So f has only one inflection point, and we now know where it is. And it's no surprise that this worked out to be an inflection point because if you have a linear function, wherever a linear function has a root, meaning wherever a linear function touches the x-axis, the linear function always goes from either positive to negative or negative to positive. So f has an inflection point at x equals b over 3a. All right. Now we have everything we need to put this all together to sketch the graph of f. That will be the last part of this problem. Sketch f of x. 
And we want to show all the different points that we found from parts a, b, and c. So we found that we always had a root where? We had one root at 0. We had another root at b over a out here. And the other interesting points were an inflection point at b over 3a and a local minimum at 2b over 3a. So now this sketching procedure is going to be the same as it was last week. So what do we know to the left of 0? We know that f, from our number line, we know that f is increasing from part b. And from part c, we know that f is concave down. And I know I've got to hit this point. So I'm going to have to start below the x-axis, increasing concave down to go through the origin. Because that was a root, and that is also, from part b, a local maximum. So according to part b, now we start decreasing, according to our number line in part b, but we're still concave down until our inflection point at b over 3a, which we found in part c. So now all the rest of the way, according to our number line from part c, f is concave up. But according to our number line from part b, f is still decreasing until we get to 2b over 3a. And then, according to our number line from part b, f is increasing all the rest of the way. So we're increasing concave up, and we've just got to be sure to hit this point, this root, and there we have it. And that root was at b over a. So now we know what every member of this family looks like. And you can even ask yourself some more questions. So for example, you could say, what happens as b increases? As b increases, the numerators of all these fractions will get bigger, meaning the graph will do what? It will get stretched horizontally. There'll be something happening vertically as well, which we'd have to, which if we figured out the y values of these points, we could decide that. Or what happens as a gets bigger, since a is in the denominator of these fractions, as a gets bigger, the fractions get smaller, meaning that as you make a bigger, the graph gets squeezed horizontally, shrunk horizontally. And that's everything there is to know about that family of curves. And we have an applet for you to let you uh, explore this by varying the values of b and a to confirm what we have just found here.